Um, my name is Brian Sheehy. This is Gabriel. Uh, what we're going to talk today about um, becoming a historian, our creation of a um, high school history lab at North Andover High. Um, a little background on the, on the two of us. Um, I've been a teacher at North Andover High for uh, 12 years now. I'm the history department coordinator. This is my second year doing that wonderful job of observing other teachers and attending meetings upon meetings. Um, I teach AP Euro. Uh, I teach sports in the past, sports in American culture, um, as I'll talk about later. Um, sports is kind of my thing. Gabe? Yes, I am a senior at North Andover High School, uh, so I've spent four years there. Um, this is my first ever presentation in this sort of setting, um, but I've taken many history classes, especially with Mr. Sheehy. Um, I took his Euro class, lots of fun. Um, and these past, I started working in the history lab with him uh, first week of December, I believe. And we've been working there ever since, and I will continue to do that until I graduate. And hopefully I'll come back a few times afterwards. So, where did this come from? Um, two different origin stories. The, uh, the first one is, um, got a uh, text from one of the other teachers in my department. Um, he's like, hey, you have to check this out. And it was a video of um, the two, like the guy on the right, Stephen Scully at Westford Academy, doing um, a simulation of trench warfare. <laughs> so re like, re like researching him, um, and he has some cool things in his classroom. He's got like antique desks. He's got typewriters uh, that kids use, so object-based learning. Um, during one of our professional development days, half the history department uh, went over there, and we observed what they were doing over, like, over there. And um, the department thought it was really, really kind of cool. Um, and, I'll get to it, and I'll get to it in a minute, how we uh, kind of continued that. Um, I've always loved history. Um, I don't think I really, truly understood or loved history until um, I was in college and I worked in, as, as an intern at the Lawrence History Center lugging all kinds of old um, tax documents around and, and really kind of getting into what it means to be a, uh, be a, uh, a historian. So um, part of the reason I wanted to create this lab was to kind of convey that to my students. Okay. Um, story of the lab. So we did the, um, the, like the observation over at Westford Academy and um, hadn't really moved forward on, on the creation of the lab. Uh, this is the slide I like to call the uh, tra tragedy and triumph slide. Um, this past uh, winter, or the past winter, um, my uncle and my, and my father passed away. So I had to clean out my uncle's house, Triple Decker and Lawrence, 100 and plus years of Sheehy history. Um, and it's tough to throw that stuff away. So I'm pulling out vacuums, I'm pulling out these, these historical artifacts. And I'm like, wow, I can take these and bring them to school and um, really kind of get the lab going kind of kick, like kickstart the whole process. Um, so here is, uh, I found a bunch of pictures of my, uh, gr my grandfather and his service in World War II. Uh, so I started taking some of those items. Uh, this is my other grand like, grandfather. So taking these objects that we had taken out of my grandmother's house, my father's house, and bringing them to school um, to share with the students. And there's obviously a picture of me, my students bored listening to me talk about all these wonderful objects. <laughs> Um, we also got some help. I mean, this isn't just me bringing in items from um, my, my family. Also got some help from the Stevens Memorial Library in town. They went and contacted the State Archive and they donated a bunch of um, books that they had digitized that they were getting rid of. Um, the North Andover Historical Society had extras of a lot of stuff. Um, again, just to populate our uh, lab. Uh, and people started donating stuff too. We got some uniforms donated, um, some, some different items donated uh, that really kind of added to the collection. How do you fund this? Uh, in, my, in my side job, I'm the president of the Essex Baseball Organization. Like I said, sports is kind of my thing. Uh, I've been doing that for a long time. Up, up there is Bethany. Spencer Pierce Little Farm, Essex Baseball Club. Make sure you go and uh, check us out. Um, we do an annual uh, fundraiser um, for breast cancer, but part of the, and it's for my mother uh, who passed away from breast cancer um, like five years ago. And part of the, the funding was for education. So again, need to build up this, this lab, need to create items for the kids to um, experience. You need, you, know, you need money. So I took some of the funds from this fundraiser 
and I started buying some stuff um, to kind of build the collection, make it ex uh, really kind of exciting for our students. Also, we just recently got a, I got a grant, I better say it right, from the State Historical Records Advisory Board. Um, we got $7,500 um, from, like, from them to put together oral histories for veterans. Um, as you'll see when we go through the rest of the uh, slide, one of the things that we've really been able to do is kind of create museum walks for World War I and World War II. Um, the goal of this, of this grant that we have is to take oral, uh, the oral histories of veterans or even reading uh, soldiers' diaries and things like that who have passed and matching them with objects. Because one of the things that we found with the creation of this lab is when students can pick up items, pick up objects, they, they, they really appreciate that more than just sitting in, 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 an, in a um, classroom listening to a teacher talk. And you know, that, that object really kind of brings to life for, for them the history. And it makes history kind of enjoyable and engaging, uh, which we'll get to in a minute. Gabe? So uh, here you can see some of the photos of the lab. Um, I'm sure he's talked a lot about how we created it, how we got money, uh, and how we kind of got the word out. But this really is what the lab is all about. Um, the picture on the right here is a display, I believe this is of the World War I display we had up. Um, and so the lab, it's, it's in a room, it's the, uh, like the high school's history lab. And in it we have lots of artifacts. As you can see there's some pictures, postcards. And so the way that it's set up, right, right now it's currently in the World War II phase. However, because we have so many different uh, exhibits, it's very easy to switch in and out from World War I to World War II or to other uh, timelines and events and exhibits that we have set up. So it's kind of like a, a vessel for teaching history in the sense of you can cater towards any lesson or any subject that you're trying to teach or any area of history that you're trying to teach currently. On the right is an example of students actually learning in the lab. Um, there's a lot of tangible artifacts as well as research that I've done, Mr. Shee's done, and other teachers have done to kind of put it together in order to convey the lessons to the students. And so that, this is a picture of them. Uh, kind of, it's, a, it's like a round table sort of, um, it's kind of like a, a walking through in order to learn the lesson. We broke up uh, for the World War I Museum walk, we broke it into 12 or 13 different categories. So students would be, brought, would be kind of separated in here, you're gonna to go to station one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, what it, like, et cetera. And each section had a different theme. Uh, we had like the war begins, uh, the world at war, we had songbooks, we had stereoscopes, we had uh, pictures, like actual World War I pictures. So students would, would kind of stop and have a couple minutes at each station um, and they would look at those objects and they would have to break down those objects and answer questions for their teacher. Their teachers did this in numerous ways, which is kind of the cool thing about this lab. If you want um, your students to just break down uh, primary source material, well at each section have them pick a postcard, have them pick a newspaper, have them pick a propaganda poster and analyze that. You want them to look at trends or themes within that um, section, they can do that as well. Um, pick, like, pick an object you like, and ten for homework tonight, you're gonna go home and research it. Um, those are some of the things that our, our teachers did. They did a variety of different things. Just to backtrack, this used to be our history office. Um, I kind of hijacked our history office. Tons of support from our administration. Principal let me do this. Uh, uh, the superintendent was like, think, like, thinks it's a great idea. Assistant superintendent was all on board, so I did get a lot of support from the North Andover school community. Another example you can see, um, you can see the stereoscopes here. The kids really enjoy these. Um, they're like, what is this? And you show them the 3D image. It kind of brings, again, history to life. And that's what we're really trying to do here. Uh, the helmets. These are two World War I helmets. And there's dents in them. And they're like, how, how do those dents come there? How do you think? You know, so it, it, again, it just builds that inquiry. And they start kind of breaking down why did that happen? How is that? You know, so just again, getting our students to think. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, what's really special about this lab is that, and you know, we talked about this in an earlier presentation with you, about how uh, all these tangible artifacts can kind of convey to students that history isn't something that's locked away in a box in the Smithsonian, in Washington, D.C. 
across the country in Paris. It's something that you can actually hold and see, and it's something that's all you know, constantly surrounding us and something that involves every single one of us. And for someone like me and Mr. Xi, you know, we were so motivated to learn and go find that history. And so it's not hard for me you know, to walk into a museum and find 30 things that I love and just spend three hours in there. But for other students, it really isn't that way. And so it's our job to kind of take our joy and our passion for history and for that learning and then turn that into a lesson. And how can we take you know, these artifacts, like I mentioned, that might be in the Smithsonian, how can we kind of convey them to our students in this, in this way? We're not going to watch the video if you're really interested in watching the YouTube video. Uh, there's a video of um, the, the North Andover Camp Studio put together. Uh, kind of go, it goes through the lab, um, interviews me about what we're trying to do. Uh, a couple items here, again, this is my grandfather's uh, diary that we um, have. Uh, started transcribing it so that, again, I can then take those experiences of my grandfather during the war and create lessons and activities for my students to um, do. Of course, all he really did the first part of the war is play softball and go to, he was stationed in, in like New York, he went to Yankees games. And, <laughs> so I'm like, oh, I guess I gotta skip ahead a little bit. To get <laughs> Um, uh, here's his discharge papers. Uh, one of the things I'm really fascinated by, and when you show kids, um, we just got a bunch of World War II um, like uh, vaccination records and pay records. Uh, so the kids are really fascinated by just seeing something that it doesn't seem like history, but it is. You know, uh, what are they being um, vaccinated for? You know, and you can have those those like this. Like, those discussions with your students about that. Uh, the dog tags, they really like those. We'll probably come back to those later. Uh, Gabe, Gabe really likes the uh, belt buckles. Belt buckles. Yeah. Um, so what's the goal? To make history fun, engaging, and enjoyable for our students. Um, as Gabe has mentioned, a lot of, like, a lot of students view history as, oh, I have to listen to this boring lecture and answer these questions, and you know, it's not. You, Everyone is here because they have a, a, a love and passion for history, okay? And our goal is to get our students to, to feel that, even if it's just for an hour, you know, get them to enjoy and appreciate history. Uh, enhancing and, and enrich what our students are, or what our teachers are doing in their classrooms. Uh, a lot of times, as we walk through the, as the kids walk through the lab, they're like, oh yeah, I remember um, my teacher talked about this the other, like, the, like the other day. So it just kind of reinforces enriches what our teachers are doing. Develop historical thinking skills. We want our students to think. We want them to, to, uh, to be able to break down primary sources. We want them to be able to synthesize, analyze, look at cause and effect, put items in the context of a time period, okay? Provide students multiple ways to learn, experience, and see uh, the work historians do every day. That's gonna lead us to kind of what Gabe is doing. Okay, uh, one of my goals when I first started this is I want my students to have the same experience I had when I was in college working at the Lawrence History Center. I want them to be able to break down documents, to, to preserve things, to digitize things. Um, I'll let Gabe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, I started working specifically in the lab at the beginning of December. And one of the first kind of things I jumped on, which I'll talk about in future slides, um, is that kind of taking taking a single object, whether that's a picture, talk about helmets, could be any of the objects in the lab, researching it and then connecting it to other things. Um, this right here, this is a diary. Um, Philip J. O'Connell, he's a he fought in World War I. He's from Lawrence, Massachusetts. Uh, Mr. Shee, he's actually doing a presentation on him in France. So uh, one of the cool things, I mean, being a, being a teacher, it allows you a lot of opportunities to um, go and explore. I was selected by National History Day to travel over to Europe um, as part of the Fallen um, Soldiers um, prog like program where you have to research somebody who um, is buried in France who, who died during World War I and put together a eulogy, kind of put together a, a story of their life. So one of the cool things that um, the Lawrence History Center has is they have Philip O'Connell's di diary from the war. Um, so I scanned it scan the whole, like the, like the whole thing. And one of the other history aides started to transcribe it. So we're digitizing things. Um, all of our World War I stuff has been digitized. Um, 
start to transcribe diaries, things like that. Um, Gabe and my other aide have, have done a great job of managing, putting up uh, exhibits, taking uh, exhibits down, just kind of to give them a broad brush of what it's like to be an archivist, what it's like to be um, in, in museum studies, so that they can see that history is not just, oh, I've gotta, if, if I want to be a history major, I've got to be a teacher. You don't. There's so many different ways um, that you can still uh, be part of history. Okay. And research. Uh, Gabe's going to talk about what he researched. Yeah, absolutely. So here you see, uh, this is a postcard. Um, that's the front of it. There's soldiers, and then those, that's the back. And those are the names of each soldier. Uh, one is on the left, eight is on the right. And so on the first day, I, uh, I found this postcard. It was on one of the tables. Uh, this is back in the World War I unit. These are soldiers from World War I. And I picked it up, and I was looking at the uniforms and everything. I turned it over, and I, I found these names. And I realized that if I could you know, find one of these names somewhere, you know, Ancestry.com, just on Google, just trying to figure out who these people were, that would be something really interesting to research. So I was going through the list, researching names, trying to figure out where they were from. And number six, Carl Holes, I found uh, on Ancestry.com. And on the next slide, show. And just a quick uh, kind of side on this. I bought these pictures at um, like an antique store in Maine. Mm -hmm. So just keep, in, keep that in mind, in Maine. So here, I, when I was doing my research, I managed to find a lot about Carl Holes. He's from Guide Rock, Nebraska. He was a soldier during World War I. Uh, he actually died, unfortunately, in France. And when I was doing research, this is his actual obituary um, that was in his Guide Rock newspaper. Um, that's his draft registration card. We found more documents. These are just two of the more important ones. Um, and so this was, like I mentioned, this was the first week I had been researching. And it, I probably spent three or four hours already. And I, you know, I had found some things, like you know, there are 3,000 mentions of Carl Holes and wherever. But I hadn't found anything that's absolutely 100% the person that was on this postcard that Mr. Sheehy bought in Maine, and until I came across this. And it was, so Mr. Sheehy at the time, he was in a meeting uh, with some other teachers, and I was so excited that I almost actually went into his meeting. Just to tell him, yeah, I, I found this. You really should have, it was a really boring meeting. Yeah. <laughs> and so that, that kind of just pure excitement um, was what I knew that I personally wanted to, and we, we agreed that it's something that we want to convey to our students, um, because three, three hours of my time and you know, turned these results, and it's kind of like a needle in a haystack. You know, while one name did yield results, there were seven others that, while I might have found mentions or locations, I couldn't really find anything of substance. But this, this obituary, you know, tells us you know stuff about him, and we have it transcribed somewhere else. Uh, but you know, if we can read this this obituary, and we can learn about him and his life, and about Guide Rock, and it's kind of you know sets us down this path where we can learn so much about just one person, and. You know, while it wasn't easy, you know, it took several hours, and but this is something that we really hope to convey to students because not every student will want to sit down for four hours to find a little bit of information. Um, I would love to do that, and so it's up to me and Mr. Sheehy and, and other students that are really truly interested in history to put in that work in order to, you know, find these results to you know teach our students. Gabe is obviously one of the reasons why I want to do this. Um, the excitement that he had in finding that, I knew that that was, was one piece of why this is so special. And, and, what, and what we're trying to do here is so special. Uh, we're going to talk in a couple of minutes about others, like other students who really don't like history. I mean, Gabe loves, like, loves history. Regardless of what I had given him, he would have been successful and, and found all, like, all kinds of things um, about the other soldiers. Um, how can our teachers utilize the lab? There's several, there's several ways. One, they can take them in there, okay? The room isn't super big, um, so it does present some problems, especially now we keep loading it with, with artifacts. <laughs> uh, it's getting tougher and tougher to bring people in. Um, but teachers can access the lab by bringing their students in there. They just schedule a time, I open up the door, uh, they come on in, um, usually, they develop some kind of activity that their students are going to be doing. Um, yeah, that? and the really cool thing about the lab is while I believe this is set up, is this World War II at the time? This yeah. Is, yeah, this is World War II. Yeah, so this is, this is set up for World War II at the time. 
Um, you know, in World War II, obviously a war, so a lot of military history. But a student can go in there, a teacher can go in there and see something, and they don't have to, you know, only research the military aspect of it. Um, you know, the 1940s, there was a war going on, but there was also people's domestic lives going on. Um, and so there's, there's kind of two sides to every story, and so any, any single one of these artifacts or you know, newspaper clippings or pictures or anything can be researched both from the military point of view as well as the domestic point of view, and there's so many ways to take lessons off of that, and so that it's, it's not just, you know, oh, let me bring the kids in here to you know, look at some helmets. It's take them in here, see what they find, you know, maybe you can do like a scavenger hunt sort of event. And it's not just, you know, find, find pictures of planes, pictures of tanks, helmets. It's, you know, what did civilians do? What was the propaganda like? You know, what was maybe the life of a teenager back in the 1940s in America? Things like that. Or what's that thing right, like right there, that old computer? <laughs> <laughs> it's really fascinating what, what kids get attracted to, and I'll get to that later. Um, but kids are always fascinated. Uh, at times when I've when I've taken adults in there, they're like, "There's so much stuff. It's like tough to like see everything." Another option for uh, teachers um, who don't feel comfortable. I mean, you could break stuff. I brought the school committee uh, in in like in there on uh, Thursday. And they're stepping on things. They're knocking things over. Um, they're almost worse than students. <laughs> but another uh, option is to take items out. Uh, on 9-11, we have a bunch of framed 9-11 uh, um, materials. We have a bunch of 9-11 uh, uh, news, uh, newspapers and magazines. A teacher took them out and did her own gallery walk around her classroom in a confined setting that she felt comfortable in. Uh, some stuff on the Bread and Rosa strike. Um, teacher was doing labor uh, strife, so we have a bunch of framed posters um, that she took out. And you know, again, another gallery walk. This was kind of cool. A teacher last year. Um, took these items, he was studying the 1950s, 1960s, and he was looking at how um, technology has changed and how technology made life easier for people. Um, so he kind of looked at the vacuum, the TV, radio. Um, so just, again, kids could be like, oh, what's that? How, how, look at that, that vacuum's weird. You know, just, just to get them excited and, and kind of looking at, at things in a different way. Um, we have digitized a lot of things. These are um, horrors of war cards that, we, that I got a whole bunch of. Um, they highlight the uh, Japanese invasion of China, um, the Spanish Civil War, and the Italian invasion of Ethiopia. Um, and one of our teachers took these scans that we had and created a document-based question around them. Um, so again, us dig like digitizing all this stuff allows our teachers to then use it and manipulate it in different, in, like, different ways. Numbers of students in the lab. Um, you can see that in September, we had 130 students come in. Um, in, in January, this is a two-day span. We had 115 students come through the lab. Uh, it was kind of crazy. It took up my, my whole couple of days. Uh, and the courses, I'll read these to you. A, AP Euro, Global Thought, American Thought, uh, which are two uh, English and history classes. Uh, U.S. history, ninth grade Engl English. Uh, we had a World War I exhibit set up, and um, they were reading All Quiet on the Western Front, so they came in and looked at that. Uh, French three, we have a bunch of postcards. Some are in German, some are in uh, French. Um, my goal is eventually to get some students who are in the, in like the AP uh, German, a like AP French sections, to come in and translate some of the stuff that we have. I have a bunch of cigarette cards from uh, Germany. Um, I think they were made right before Hitler came, uh, came to power or around when he came to power. So very interesting perspective on World War I. Be great to have that translated and um, accessible for our, like, like for our students. A choir, why would choir be coming in? They were um, doing stuff on World War I, songs about World War I, and we have a bunch of song books. So they came in to look at some of those song books. So again, these items and objects can be accessed um, throughout a lot of courses. I'm hoping that uh, in North Andover, we're going to kind of roll this out K, like K through 12. And object-based learning is going to become something that all of our students are doing um, from elementary all the way up to high school. 
Um, teachers taking stuff out of the lab and utilizing it. 245 uh, students were able to utilize materials uh, from the lab in their classroom. Dave, you want to go over what kids said about this? Yeah, so um, after taking one of the, I believe it was a group of sophomores. Uh, yes. So a group of sophomores, like we said, one of the ways to uh, experience the lab is to go into the lab and have teachers bring classes in. And so a teacher brought her uh, sophomores in. And so we had each of them write responses. And so the responses fluctuated as far as like whether it was good, bad reviews. Um, and so you know, using those responses, we're able to take away what are we doing well, what are we doing improperly, and you know, wh which things would students like more of, which things would they like less of, and what really actually can teach students. Um, kind of like I said, I, I really do love history, so I am biased because you know, you can hand me anything in the lab and I'll be fascinated with it, whereas some other students, you really have to figure, find that one specific thing, and that's what's gonna draw them in. And so using responses and feedback, we can constantly kind of tweak the program, tweak the lab in order to move forward. I mean, just this right, like right here, um, because it helped uh, the war and it made it easier to visualize what uh, that time was like. Again, just to kind of put students in the context of that time period. Um, kids really just enjoy um, looking at the influence that uh, soldiers and civilians had. Um, offers a different way of learning. That's kind of a recurring theme. Um, there are some of these that look at, I like science, and I found it was kind of interesting. Um, I had like a popular science from uh, 1980, like 18, and it was some crazy tank thing that rolls around. Um, kids thought that was fascinating, that they're thinking of these uh, different advancements in technology. Um, so again, just tying in other kids who are not interested in history. Um, okay. <laughs> that person has terrible hand, handwriting. Uh, tough, tough to read. Uh, <laughs> uh, so here, I'm going to talk about a couple activities that we did. Um, with the museum walk, one of the teachers um, gave them a source analysis sheet. So um, they had to find a postcard somewhere in the museum walk, a newspaper somewhere in the museum walk, um, different artifacts that they could break down and analyze. Um, again, just to un like, un like understand and, and interpret primary sources. Change over time, a time hop activity. Um, I, was, I was teaching, this is something that I, um, that I created uh, with my AP Euro class. You can't, with an AP class in general, you're kind of stuck to time. Uh, so we were taking down the World War I exhibit, uh, but I wanted my students to see it. So I put together this time hop activity that um, looked at change over time. We were, like, we were currently studying the French Rev. So I, I tasked them with, we're going to go up there. What things have changed from the French Rev to World War I, and what things have stayed the same? Okay, and well, again, a lot of the technology changed, but the countries, some of the countries were still the same. So they were able to kind of look at that and, and, and see how in a, in, a, in a less than 200 years, uh, society had drastically changed. Um, synthesizing, how do things connect to other time periods? Um, Students had great discussions with their teachers connecting objects to today, objects to things that they studied before. So again, just, just developing those critical thinking skills through, like, through the museum walks. Cause and effect, again, um, just some of the things that they can do. Here's a change over time activity that I really enjoy. And it doesn't, it's not really history specific. It's more object uh, specific. And you can see here, these are, um, admissions tickets for Disneyland. And again, kids, when you're talking about how to teach with objects, oh, Disney World, I was, I was there with my uh, parents like a couple months ago. That's a way to bring them in. And they're gonna be learning historical thinking skills without even knowing it, okay? So, 1970s um, admissions ticket. These are admission tickets, that's a, it's a great forearm, Gabe. Great, great hand model, I guess. Um, those, are, those are fast passes. More like, like, like more current fast passes. Um, so then you can start break, like breaking it down. Why in the 1970s are they using paper? Why today do they have fast, like fast passes? What's the point of a fast pass? What's the, uh, why are they using paper? Why are they using different tech, like technology? Um, just, just to get them thinking of, of how things change in, in, in that. And 
you know. Um, it leads to all kinds of great discussion. Future, um, we'd like to continue our, our veterans grant. We're really looking forward to kind of collecting some of the oral histories and then creating mini uh, exhibits for, like, for them. Digitizing and properly cataloging the material. Um, I wish I had more, like, more time to, to do a lot of the things our like, archivists should be doing. Um, creating us, uh, numbers and, and, or, and like, organizing everything, but we're gonna continue to work on that. Uh, expanding the, like, the collection, um, continuing to grow, and to uh, have objects that really hit all of our, uh, like all of our uh, curriculum. And creating more lessons and activities like I showed some of you. Uh, talk about a couple of our, our, our favorite pieces and then I'll open it up to any questions that you guys might have. Yeah, so uh, the one on the left here, uh, there's two, two pieces and then I'm kind of explaining them. These, these two belt buckles are arguably my two favorite artifacts we have uh, in the lab. They are, as you might be able to tell, they're, they're Nazi belt buckles um, that actually were once used by Nazi soldiers. Um, and the reason I find them so fascinating is because as an American who's never been to Europe, I have never come into contact with German soil or people who have like, lived in Germany their entire lives. But you know, being only living only 30 no minutes north of Boston, I you know know several uh, people. Or I, I have a connection to American history. Boston's a huge center for that. Um, my great grandfather fought in World War II, but from the American side. So if I were to have a belt buckle with American flag, that's not super crazy because I mean, Mr. Sheehy has you know two grandfathers who also fought in the war. That's not that uncommon to know someone or know of someone or just even seeing a book like, oh, this is an American military uniform because you know, we're, we're on the home front. But the Nazis lost the war. We aren't from Germany. And so all these factors kind of coming together, the, fa the fact that there are two actual belt buckles that can sit in a student's hand in North Hanover, Massachusetts. You know, How did they get plus there? years ago. And I just think that's so fascinating that, you know, especially if you look at the history of Nazis, World War II, and then even that can even dive into you know uh, who sponsored the Nazis, uh, who made their things. Hugo Boss, Mercedes Benz. There's there's so many ways to take these these two simple pieces of brass, and I I just have really always found that very interesting. This is one of my favorites. I was at a flea market up in uh, Londonderry, New Hampshire, and I was at a, I was walking across a table, and that was there. I was like, whoa, Fit like fifteen dollars. I got that. Um, started researching this guy, uh, George Burgon. Uh, he was from Jaffrey, New, like, like New Hampshire. Um, again, that could be another whole research project that we haven't gotten into yet. Um, I love the, the pictures. I love the imagery of it. Um, I just think it's really cool. The kids kind of uh, gravitate towards it. Gabe likes this one, and there, and the, and the other aide uh, who's 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 in there right now really likes this one. Um, you want to explain yes. why? <laughs> this, this, I would say, is my second favorite piece in the lab. Um, not just because it's colorful. It is very nice, though. Um, I, I like what it represents and kind of what it tells me in such a simple, uh, you know, it's a, it's a cartoon. You know, it's, it looks like a Microsoft, uh, uh, like a Sheets, Sheets slide. Um, it, it's, very, it's very simple, but at the same time, it tells us so much. So what it is, it's a postcard. And there is um, space to write on the back if you do have time to write a note. But the purpose of something like this was for soldiers who didn't necessarily have time to sit down, you know, spend 10 minutes of their day writing a letter to someone at home. They could literally check off, kind of go through a whole letter. They go, dear mom, I just arrived by rail. I've been on guard duty. I need rest. And you know, that, that concept is someone who, you know, my phone's right there. I don't, I, I don't think I've ever written a letter to your mom. <laughs> I'll, 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 get, I'll get to that. <laughs> um, you know, I, I would just text you, write you an email, see you in person. And so, you know, this makes me think, like, which soldier, you know, had this in his pocket? Who was he going to write it to? And what was he going to say to them? What would he have said to them if he wasn't, you know, uh, in France, in, uh, in the Pacific? And so I just think that, you know, we think of like you know you, you maybe read uh, Soldier's Diary, you watch a movie, and letters is very, is very uh, really the only way that they could communicate with people back at home. Um, but 
there's so much going on in the war and so much commotion that maybe a soldier didn't have time to write a letter. And so this is kind of one of the ways uh, that they would talk. Plus, just saying, like, dear gang. Or maybe this was the only thing that they could write about. Yeah. <laughs> Another perspective. Yeah. And so I, I just have always been intrigued. It's colorful. It's nice. Picture on the left. Um, great woman uh, invited me over to her house in North Andover to uh, get some uniforms. She was cleaning out her uh, mother's house, uh, and she had some great Navy uniforms and some uh, Army uniforms. Then very strangely, she's like, oh, I'll come into my basement. <laughs> Make sure I called some people beforehand. Hey, I'm at this address. You don't see me in a couple hours. Please, please come and get me. I'm tied up. Uh, she asked me if I, if I wanted this cash register. I said, yeah, sure. Kids, one of the first things that they do is run over to that thing and start just hitting it. Um, because they want to touch it. They want to experience it. Um, picture on the right. I think the... Um, IT director, he brought up a computer for us uh, so that we could digitize some stuff. He also brought, uh, brought up an old uh, Mac computer that, again, kids love. Um, he's like, hey, I have this weird machine. Do you want it? I said, yeah, sure. Didn't tell me what it, like, what it was. Just kind of threw it in my, like, in my room. I'm like, it looks cool. Never really researched it because, you know, I have a billion other things to research and find out about. Um, one kid, when he went into the lab, gravitated right towards that thing. He started trying to play with it, figure out what it was. I had no like, idea. He found the pattern number and researched and found that it was the Topmatic knotting machine. Um, I'm not really sure what a knotting machine does. He sent me a video and all this kind of stuff, but just the excitement in objects. And you could see it there, you know? Um, I think it knots like thread or something. <laughs> okay, it's cool. but. If you guys have any questions, want to get in touch with me, this is how to get in touch with me. Um, I'll open it up to questions now. We have a couple minutes if you have any. It's not a question, but it's more of a comment. What you guys are doing is absolutely phenomenal. Thank you. As a junior in college right now, this is the stuff that I'm doing. And if I had access to that in high school, I probably wouldn't have changed my major five times. <laughs> um, the access that you're giving the stu these students to tangible artifacts, as well as the knowledge of the processes, is absolutely amazing and something you should be doing. Thank you. Thank you. So, like, um, this is really great. I'm so happy that you guys have these resources. But I went to like, a really, really tiny high school in rural Washington State, right, Idaho, mm -hmm. and we didn't have the money or the space or the access to the kind of stuff. Do you have any plans on working with other schools and trying to bring what you have to other places? I'd like to. Um, I was down in D.C. last week uh, with, a, with a tour, and I contacted the Smithsonian, and they have a object um, lab, and they offer professional development. So I would eventually, I, I think this is great, obviously, uh, and I'd love to get this in other places. And a lot of the items, they don't need to be anything super special. I mean, you could go to... Um, and anybody who wants to get rid of a bunch of crap <laughs> can just donate everything, and, and, and you have the base there. Um, but I'd like to eventually get out there and do, and do more. I think it would be great. Yeah. We also um, we met with an archivist last week, and just in general, the, the process of digiti digitizing excuse me, and cataloging and putting together everything together into one kind of cohesive uh, online format, which can then be accessed by anyone uh, in the world. I don't know if we'll get that far. And then you could take it to a place. Like yeah. if you had objects that, like, if, if somebody want, really, really wanted to do something on this topic, <laughs> if it was made available through a digital um, database, we could then take that box or whatever to that location and, and have, teach a lesson or something. Hi. Fantastic. Um, so I just wanted to see if I could get some demographics. So 135 students are great. If there's 200 students, but not if there's 10,000. So I wonder if you have some demographics of the school, and if there are any explicit changes that you saw in, in your assessment data. So were students getting high grades? Were they reading more? Were they, are there any, yeah, any kind of tangible? tangible I haven't tangible? done the long-term studies. I'm, I'm debating whether to go get my PhD. That would be a great topic right there. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's 4,000 kids in the like in this school. Um, not everyone has uh, history at, at all at all times. I'd say 
there's 12 people in the history department. I'd say half of them. It's bigger than my university. Don't tell my boss that. <laughs> He's trying to cut some history. I don't, I don't want him to cut the history department. Um, I'd say half of them are currently utilizing it. Uh, once we start rolling out, I think more professional development. If there's any teachers in the, like in the room, just block your ears. Most teachers are very lazy. <laughs> um, in, in, you, you have to almost give them the, okay, here is how you do it. Um, so this is only a year old. Um, this is less than a year old. Um, so rolling it out, getting lessons, getting those kind of things, it's a process, and I'm working on it. I'd like to make it, please come on in. Here's how easy it is. Um, so it, the numbers sound small. I've talked to um, different historical organizations. When they saw those numbers, they're like, I can't believe those, like that many people came, like, came in because small historical societies don't have 100 kid, like, people walking through their doors uh, in a month's span. And that's, it's going to grow. Um, don't have the numbers yet on how that translates into um, ac like, like the academic side of it, but there's my thesis. <laughs> <laughs> Up there. Yeah, so uh, you talk about the uh, glory of connecting the dots and finding the obit. Yeah. Have there been situations for you or your peers where you've gone down a certain road in terms of making an assumption and then you've had to find out from research you're disappointed because something didn't quite come together the way you hoped? Yeah, the internet's a terrible place. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, a lot of the research I, it's kind of, it's, it's not anything that's necessarily been taught to me um, in the sense of I kind of just like maybe start with a name or a location. Kind of like any, any shred of evidence that I have, and I try to go from that. And whether that's you know, Googling uh, Carl Holes in quotations and like Nebraska in quotations a billion times, um, or maybe you know, using the school library and going through books like that. Um, but oftentimes, kind of like I had said, I had spent three hours uh, just on that specific postcard and um, up and he was the sixth person, so there was five dead ends. Um, and that, while that is very disappointing, it's also kind of taught me an appreciation for that, that final goal, um, or that, that final, uh, just, just reaching that final conclusion. Um, and I think that there is, there's so much in the lab that for as many you know, dead ends that there will be, um, there'll be just as many uh, you know, stories and research projects. Um, but I, I don't want to be the one to find all of those. I want you know, other students, Mr. Shiji, when he's not doing his other billions of things. Uh, I, I'm excited for next trimester. We're going to start our uh, veterans grant. Gabe's going to be doing a lot with interviewing vet, like veterans and then re like researching more of their story. And thankfully, this trimester, uh, twice a week, I would have meetings during the period that Gabe was in the lab. Um, so he would want to talk to me and be like, I got to go to a meeting to talk about a meeting, to talk about another meeting. Um, so this trimester, um, I, I, don't, I don't have meetings during the time I'm with him, so I'll be able to kind of guide him a little bit more through some more research, which, like, which would be great. Over here, then I'll go to Bethany. Um, I have three things. Um, first of all, do you allow visitors to come to your lab? Like if we said to, for instance, I have high schoolers, and I can tell the teacher, We've got to check out. Could they contact you and come see what you're doing? Yeah, we're always, uh, as long as you contact me, we'll figure out a time and, and get that going. And also, I noticed you're an um, um, AP Euro teacher. Are you planning to go to Europe to find some uh, artifacts? Or well, I'm going to Europe have... for the National History, oh, okay. History Day. So um, if they let me sneak away, I definitely want to try to find some kind of shops and market. smuggle some things. Yeah. And then I just wondered if you could take some of these artifacts to a broader audience in the school. I know there are often locked cases around or, you know, um, things like that. Would you so we're working on, uh, it a little bit? We're working oh. on um, different, like, different things. Everything costs money. We're on the budget like this. Um, <laughs> We're thinking, I actually have some old windows. We're going to make some display cases out of some old windows and stuff like that, and maybe put them in other parts of the school so people can see them. Cool. My question is for you, Gabe. I get to see Kathy all the time. So um, I think that I work in a you know small museum, and I think that we are very tempted to think that we need to reach young people by involving technology. And one of the things that I'm sensing from you is that 
make these new buys late, sure. but that there's sort of a, a blowback against that of wanting to get back to the real object that you can put in your hand. So having a picture of a belt buckle, you, you spoke very eloquently to the idea that this belt buckle is something that has this incredible story because you're yeah. holding the physical mm -hmm. object. Can you talk a little bit about how you see the sort of real object-based learning and technology either working together or you think that it's, you know, I, I don't need to see any more touch screen kiosks. Anymore. Yeah, um, and so there was a great presentation earlier from the gentleman over there who, uh, he kind of got my mind thinking specifically about that question. And I think the number one uh, benefit or the pro of technology and especially in tangent to learning and history is the convenience. Um, a few questions have been about, can I, can I access this from somewhere else? And you know, if, if everything's digitized, then yes, you can. And so that's huge. Um, but then there's also a huge amount of value to, you know, like you said, holding that belt buckle. Because it's more than just a belt buckle. It, it can teach so many stories, and it represents so much. And so I personally have found, again, I'm biased because I really do love history, um, but that seeing even if it's like like if it's a piece of cloth and it was like you know George Washington once wore this, I would I would look at the thing at least like twenty minutes, maybe thirty minutes, and so because I you know I know what that represents and then my mind would just start rolling like when did he wear this and I like just all the things I know and I would just kind of start connecting that and so if we can kind of spur that thought with those tangible artifacts and kind of jar students from their history is boring this isn't fun history was 50 years ago, then I think that is definitely more beneficial than an iPad, which is you know, very nice for presentation. Like, all this technology makes makes our work come together quite well. Um, but I think that the, you know, kind of like the raw, sort of um, unrefined aspect of history is, is incredibly important. We're, we're definitely cool to hang out, because the uh, thing the uh, session later, but I'll let everybody uh, go to the next session. Uh, if you want to stick around, I'm happy to talk to you guys. Appreciate it. You can see why I brought Gabe. He's very eloquent.